Alex, you've been a, an observer of consciousness studies for many years, and I'd like to get your sense of the field. Uh, it's, um, it has developed as a field during my intellectual life, lifetime, the last, uh, I don't know, 35, 40 years, perhaps, uh, uh, in terms of its, uh, its development. Uh, so when you look at the studies today, the, the journals, the conferences, the your colleagues in different aspects, uh, and take a, 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 a bird's eye view, better a God's eye view uh, of the field of consciousness <laughs> studies uh, from your own perspective. So then allow me to rewind 400 years and quickly fly back to the present. The story of science could be, could be summarized as Galileo amongst others, dividing the natural world and saying, we'll start first with that who lends itself to measurement and mathematization better. And we leave that, the second part, for later. The second part turns out to be what we sense, pain, what we experience. Now, 400, 400 years, science has excelled at that. Physics, and chemistry, and biology. Psychology already <laughs> started to encounter the psyche, right? Now, as many of us know, consciousness studies was sanctioned 30 years ago by a Nobel laureate, right, by Crick. I mean, that's a simplistic way of putting it, but it's very relevant. And then it ceased to be a taboo topic. Many people were studying it, nevertheless, underground. So that's to say, out of 400, we've had really 30 years to come back to what Galileo yeah. had left. When I was doing my doctorate in, in neurophysiology, I was doing it because I was interested in consciousness. And I, I had a great relationship with my mentor and the head of the department and everything. But I don't remember ever mentioning the term because it wasn't... It wasn't part of our thinking. I was dealing with thalamocortical uh, uh, circuits. Uh, but consciousness, even though that was my yes. real motivation, it never came up. So you see, we've only had 30 years, and that's nothing in science. Now, these 30 years have been very, very interesting. Uh, where are we now? Well, there are many theories, and also thanks to your work in, in outlining uh, with detail all the trees of the landscape of consciousness, we, know, we now know that there are more than 200, at least 200 theories of consciousness. Some are philosophical, some are scientific, some are more easily testable than others. Sure, this is sure. another discussion. What, what I say we are now, I would describe it with a, this, this image of a stool, the stool of science, because we used to think that, that science can stand on one leg, which is just, let's just get more data. Hmm. Let's be empirical about it. Let's try to find neural correlates of consciousness. But then we, we soon realized that we also need theories. Science needs to stand on, of course, the most sophisticated tools to measure brains and so on. But theory and, and, and data are in this, in this dance. I mean, there's nothing new about that, but we often forget it. So, so the relevance of being more formal about what theories of consciousness, mm -hmm. what, they, what they postulate, why, what they predict, and so on. But then there's a third leg to the stool, which is very interesting too, which is the social political oh. aspect. Mm. So I feel that now we can start to open the door to more heterodox approaches and even heretical, heretical approaches to consciousness. So I think we're living kind of a very interesting mix. It, it is as if consciousness today was in an adolescent um, stage, right? after a quick infancy, mm. we, are now, we have now the deluxe neuroscience labs with the cutting edge technology, but then new philosophical views are going, coming back and also very interesting, challenging data are being put into the table. And we can, I have the feeling that we can start being open and, and, and talk about all of this mm. together, which creates a lot of tension. But I think this tension brings, it's going to bring some heat and, and the, the obvious discussions, but also light. What you're saying is, is aspirational, and it, it comes from a, a pluralistic point of view, which, which you have, and not, and not wanting to uh, close the discussion too early. Uh, that's why in my landscape paper, I specifically said I'm not going to evaluate any of these theories. I'm going to do my very best to explain each one as if it were my theory and I was the author, but I'm not going to touch evaluation because I think it's too soon to close off activities. But if I look at the field, I would have said that each of the different areas that I'm now covering had its own community and its own world. They had their own conferences, their own colleagues, their own communication. And not only didn't they associate with the other groups, 
they, if you would ask them, they would have disdain for them. I think that's changing to some degree, but I think we have to recognize that's where it, it has been. Yes, there are many tribes, and I think we're all invited or forced to, to work together because this is a big problem. This is not just one more problem. Another thing I would say about how I see the field today is that finally this kind of monoculture has, has ended. What I mean by that is that very recently you had, it, it was a true alternative for choice between physicalism or dualism. Yes. And the way it was phrased was, well, and of course, dualism, they would say, it's, it's, a, it's an absurdity. So out of the two, you must choose physicalism. But that's, that's over anymore. That's not the case anymore. And now we have other options. And that pisses some people off because they've been living in, in these waters for a long, for a long time, just enjoying um, these presuppositions. Mm -hmm. But now they're coming out of the surface. And well, it's time, to, it's time to talk about the elephants in the room. And there are many. Yeah. So what are some, what are some examples of, of um, ways of thinking, uh, shall I say, that are different than the traditional physicalism or materialism and, and dualism, that there are two fundamental substances in reality, a physical and a okay. non-physical. Well, one example is panpsychism, which is also usually strolled man very quickly, dismissed by saying, well, I'll, I will kick the stone, as, yeah. as, and therefore I disprove it. But the idea that everything is unsold you know, all things are full of gods that, uh, that the old philosophers would say. It's not that outrageous as, as it may seem. Now, I have my own critiques of panpsychism because the idea of saying that consciousness is a property of matter still does, does a bit of disservice mm. to what I think consciousness is. Mm. But anyways, another one could be idealism. And there, your monism goes from it's all matter to it's all mind. So then I'm fine with the swap. Now let's see what it has to explain what idealism has to explain and what it has to of offer. Yeah. And, and, and those are long-standing philosophical ideas of looking at the world that goes back a long time, uh, both of which have gotten new, uh, new uh, uh, energy and new forces, yes. new people, and, and it's, it's very important to think about. Um, I, I'm thinking about some of the, um, the, the categories of data points that uh, are affecting the traditional materialist or neurobiological kinds of models, uh, such as uh, phenomenology, neurophenomenology, uh, which gives equal weight to, to the experience and to the neuro neurology, but still within a quasi-materialist uh, way of thinking, which is a little fuzzy. Uh, and then, of course, all the, um, the outliers that are often rejected. Um, Psy and parapsychology, psychedelics, does that give us a veridical uh, insight into some fundamental reality, near-death experiences, uh, all of these other kinds of uh, categories. Um, and so how have those affected the, the development and how should they? Yeah, I'm entertaining them, all of them, I would say. Um, I find them all very important to bring. And, and as you're saying, they're in a way they're not new. These are already established ways of thinking, but that need to be brought back to the context of today. When it comes to neurophenomenology, for instance, I think the idea there is that the so-called heart problem, well, the heart problem is a problem for physicalists, actually. The neurophenomenologists try to say, well, we will dissolve that problem by trying to put on the same footing, experience and experiment. And, and doing that is hard because science is, as science is built, well, experience goes um, travels in second class and, and experiment is first class. So this balance is, is really difficult. But, but it, this epoche, right, this, if you, this philosophical, it, it, it's a very strict philosophical, even, even mystical approach to thinking about consciousness, which is how can we do it from within very well at the same time that we do it in the labs, also with our best tools. And when it comes to these data points, sure, near-death experiences are coming more not just to the, to the mainstream of, of public attention, but, but scientists are continuing to study them with more vigor and, and other, yeah, other edges of, of human experience that have always been there. But now, when you look at them together, they seem to provide at least a, a direction, a, a pointer to another way of conceiving, not just consciousness, but also I would say the cosmos.